This gorgeous silk slip was made to wear with a wedding dress and has been part of the bride's trousseau. The bridal trousseau consisted of many items, from housewares and linens to outerwear, but lingerie was an especially crucial component. During the 19th century, trousseaus were often put on view for family members and friends. So if you're new here, I'm making a wardrobe from scratch. In my last video, I explained and showed you how I make a very simple, beginner-friendly, bias-cut lace trim slip. And I made pattern instructions so you can construct one for your own measurements. But let's say, hypothetically, you'd want to spend even more time and create something a bit more intricate with beautiful lace insets, maybe even something worthy of a bride's trousseau. Before the holidays, I was really ambitious, so I made one as a gift for my mom as well. I used this gorgeous powdery blue silk because she loves this color. I was a bit hasty with the lace, but I learned a lot and I want to show you things I wish I would have done better. I finished it off at the top with a bias tape that starts here in the back, goes into the armhole, becomes a strap and ends in the back here again. So I'm going to make a fresh one today and show you how I work with bias tape and with lace. I'm using the exact same pattern as for the black slip. I view this pattern as a sort of blank canvas. I already cut my silk and stay stitched the edges. But just so we are on the same page, I want to quickly distinguish the general lace inlay methods I'm gonna use on the slip here. First of all, lace can act as a trimming. You can stitch it onto your fabric and then cut the fabric back. The stitching then can follow the design of your lace or the edge of your lace. It will act as a border, prevent fraying and create a beautiful transition. You can also stitch the lace onto your fabric without cutting it back to create a full embroidery effect and applique. With wider laces you can easily use a combination of these techniques. It's almost like creating a collage with lace and it depends on how crazy you're willing to go. On this beige one I just put two darts into the lace to form a light curve for the center front and in the back I cut the lace so that it ends with these three roses. This appears to almost hide some deeper allegorical meaning but here as well the lace hides the bias tape that becomes a strap and the hem I just simply trimmed like I did on the previous black one. When it comes to the placement of lace, there are endless, 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 endless possibilities. Now, I don't want to pretend like I have a novel artistic vision here. It's going to be a fairly classic slip with a bit of asymmetry, with a full slit maybe. And I usually start by inspecting my lace to understand where the interesting parts are, how the patterns flow into each other. This is a fairly standard polyester knit net with floral motifs that are emphasized with this embroidered outline on top to look like Chantilly lace, but it's not authentic French lace and it actually has a few folds. I'm too broke for the real thing um, and I'm still very excited to use this one. It is not symmetrical and the pattern repeat is relatively large so it gives plenty of opportunity for interesting inserts. I chose it because I like the pattern and I initially wanted to dye it black. Coincidentally though it matches the silk that I had lying around here. A slightly different hue but you know dyeing and matching tones is a very complicated topic in itself so it's worth a try. In my experience and with my skill set when working with lace that match Matches the color of your fabric, mistakes are not as noticeable, it is much more forgiving. And since we're going full Moulin Rouge here, let's talk about colorful undergarments for a minute. For centuries in medieval and early modern Europe, underwear of the soft type, like drawers, chemises, nightgowns, those were predominantly white or had the color of the natural fibers that were used to make said clothes. A shift or chemise would have been worn closest to the skin, it would provide warmth, but it would also absorb sweat so it would act as a great barrier to protect the costly, intricate clothes worn over it and that were barely washed, if at all. Having several shifts or even changing them several times throughout the day, having underwear that was decorated where visible, with delicate lace or embroidery would actively demonstrate leisure and obviously the privilege of having servants who would care for your textiles. Now, while it's comparably easy to get stains out of sturdy materials like cotton or linen that hadn't been dyed or had been bleached, it also shows stains very quickly. Because it touches bare skin, spotless white obviously exhibits cleanliness and by extent it would also reflect the wearer's propriety. I'd even argue that it demonstrates an almost 
otherworldly purity of a body that is beyond very human functions. I mean, this whole connection to deity and chosen by God self-representation had been an important pillar of the ruling class. Soft underwear would also give a softer surface against the skin and act as a barrier between hard underwear like stays, paneers, later corsets, crinolines and bustles. And here especially with stays, color and decoration was not that uncommon at all. And there are several beautiful examples that have been preserved. Though once we get out of the Baroque era, white, subdued, natural shades become dominant for corsets, for rigid underwear as well. And for a while it seems like stockings were the last vestige of color in the underwear department. Colorful lingerie, though still mostly that of the hard type, became increasingly popular in the later 19th century, although it was initially viewed with suspicion. Contemporary French historian Octave Uzan wrote, The last remains of feminine modesty sunk out of sight, drowned by the prevalent mania for elaborate underclothing. Within this obsession with modesty, lavish, Luxurious underthings were obviously associated with those whose profession it was to seduce. And yet colorful corsets, colorful petticoats became very popular. They also became cheaper in general, synthetic dyes became widespread. There is also an article, which is most likely a rumor, but it suggests that Queen Victoria had worn a red petticoat to reawaken the dormant conjugal susceptibility of Prince Albert. As we move forward, the silhouette shrinks, underwear becomes skimpier, the sensibilities towards modesty change. A variety of styles and colors were available, but overall I'd say that the color palette of choice, the color palette that is proper and generally accepted, stays rather neutral. Beige peachy black with a few muted blues here and there. Also for practical reasons this is the standard selection even today because those colors won't show too much underneath clothes. During that time beige was obviously meant to match lighter skin tones and there wasn't really a diverse range yet because of white normativity. In the 60s the youthful look prevails and with it color though mostly pastel hues and patterns that are very much of that time became very fashionable for underwear as well. Later in the 80s, 90s, the attitude towards the risque, provocative, vulgar changes dramatically. With it, the meaning of brighter, bolder, actively erotic styles is rearranged. And here I think the Victoria's Secret fashion shows phenomenon of the early 2000s plays a huge part in the general public's opinion on underwear, especially on colors that are acceptable. That's also a time when underwear that peaks from underneath the clothes, even in bold, contrasting shades, becomes a somewhat acceptable part of an outfit. All this variety in color is relatively new, but nothing out of the ordinary for us anymore, likely to be found in many lingerie drawers. However, I'd say that the established palette still stands. The variety in skin colored underwear becomes a bit wider, though still lacking, let's be honest. And I'd say that around the 2000s, dark blue and red also joins this sort of must-have color palette of choice. There is also the tradition to wear red underwear on New Year's Eve for good luck. I wasn't able to find any reliable sources on its origin. It sounds to me like a marketing campaign of sorts, actually. Do some of you do that? I usually forget to, but I think a bit of good luck never hurts, right? I'm currently reading this book about the color red and how it had been perceived throughout history. So next time I'll be making something red, I'll give you all the details. As usual, I start with the center front. I think this part here might be an interesting opportunity for a peephole. With that in mind, I play around with different positions, try out different angles from the straps down to the center to find where I can join the lace pieces into a V shape. And I want to create a bit of overlapping for a portion of the wavy edge with the lashes in the center, but further down I want it to blend seamlessly into each other. By the way, a very common placement here to make uh, the edge of one lace piece 
overlap the other and go further down to create this very typical asymmetry but I actually prefer a bit more harmony when it looks as if it were one whole piece. My advice here is do not rush this process. Think ahead of the neckline you want to create, which parts of the lace you want to keep. Once I found a position I like, I quickly base the pieces together. I'm going to make two stitches, one to merge them together into this uh, peephole thingy I showed you earlier and another to connect the lace that's underneath to homogenically blend into the motifs of the overlapping lace. Apparently it's called a lace on lace applique seam. As usual I did that with a narrow zigzag stitch. I followed uh, this embroidered outline on my lace and I'm going to trim the excess. I think these two stitches are barely noticeable. I place it onto my front piece, make sure that the center is in the center where the marking is, that it's not crooked. I make some tea and I start basting. It might look like I have a technique here, but I'm just mindlessly stitching, making sure that every leaf, every little thing is set and won't move once I transfer to the machine. This, you know, it takes time, but it's gonna be worth it. I don't want this neckline to be too revealing. I'm already on dangerous terrain with this color. So I try to imagine and memorize the outline of the lace I have to follow. It's supposed to be done with a special machine with a special foot attachment or at least without a foot. <laughs> I'm not nearly skilled enough though, so I use the regular foot. I work very slowly and rotate the fabric. And you can barely see anything, which is good. On the reverse, um, Here's the line for my neckline, for my decollete line. By the way, if you want to, if you're working with wider lace, you can also place your lace so that it would go over the side seam. You just need to connect your pieces first. I don't think it's necessarily worth it, but it's an option and I tried it out. Okay, decisions have to be made on which parts to keep and which ones to cut. I'm going to try and be a bit more selective here. The blue one turned out to be kind of oversaturated with lace. If you're gonna go down very low with your lace, you have to make sure that it's not too bulky. Remember, it's bias cut, it needs to stay a bit stretchy, especially in the waist area. So just keep that in mind. Like I said, I want to make this a peephole or a keyhole, I honestly don't know what to call it. So I need to encircle the lace here. It took a bit of time, but voila! If you do that, if you want to achieve the same effect, I really recommend to look at your stitching on the wrong side very closely before you cut anything and to make sure that all those lines look very organic and rounded and curved so that there are no harsh angular lines where the flowers are, for example, because that can sometimes happen when you rotate the fabric and stitch over a rounded line and only look at it on the right side. I used to think that because of the net, because it's very florally, patterny, it won't be too nice noticeable but then once you cut your lace it becomes very noticeable on the right side as well unless of course it's the pointy leaves those should be pointy of course the basting stitches can be pulled out of there now i'm going to cut out the fabric and now i'm going to cut the lace as well like i said this lace has not the best um, quality if these polyester things keep peeking out of there i'm going to try and melt them but i think the zigzag stitch might keep them at bay and i'm also going to cut away all of those faulty leaves cutting the net is fairly easy as i said before with the stitching you can go as crazy as you can handle here i actually stitched each one of those leaves individually onto the fabric later i got too lazy and kept most of the net in between most of the middle parts but also remember that too much stitching can also affect the elasticity of the bias cut fabric so maybe don't go too crazy actually to create this um, people <laughs> i made an extra stitch that encircles it and i just cut out the fabric Oh, I think I was right to be excited about it. I think it looks great. This fresh dose of dopamine makes me want to make a few more, maybe at the center of one of these flowers. Okay, I made another one. It is barely noticeable, but these sort of details make me very happy. On the back piece, I used the exact same technique. I aligned it so that the high point of the scalloping would be at center back. I already stitched it on. I want to make a slightly asymmetrical cutout here as well and a bit of faux embroidery. The lace piece starts here and here. 
where the markings for my straps are. The lace will hide those later, it will hide the starting point of the bias tape as well. So until that's done I'm going to leave them loose, leave them be. And also I'm not going to cut my fabric back just yet, but I can already cut some of the lace. And these parts here that will hide the straps, I leave them for now. However, here as well I couldn't resist and I already cut a little hole at the center of the rose again. Oh, another tip that is kind of on the nose, but I didn't think about it beforehand. Never use identifiable motifs like, in my example, roses or flowers as part of the cutout at the edge. This might seem clever on paper, but the fabric will overlap there once you cut it back. So always leave a bit of a buffer, a bit of space around those. If they are part of the cutout or if they serve as full embroidery to keep them um, distinguishable. It will just make everything blend better into each other. I'm going to connect my pieces with a French seam. More details on that in my previous video. A short slip like this I think doesn't really need any slits. However, if you want to you can absolutely create a slit at the side seam with a French seam as well. On this blue slip I made one. I didn't film how because it was a last minute decision and I didn't have enough seam allowance to work with. But just so you know, the option is there. You just need to add some extra seam allowance at the height of the slit. But now onto the annoying, tricky, less meditative part. We're going to add the bias tape. So it'll start in the back and go around like a strap and end in the back again. By the way, you can also use fold over elastic here. This might actually be a bit easier. But to make it a bit more homogenic, I'm going to make my own from scratch. You might know ready-made bias tape like this. It has folds and it is meant to be folded again over the edge. The reason we need for this tape to be cut on bias is, again, the stretchiness it gives. Because that way you can mold it into a curve like that. So I measured the length that I roughly need and I cut out two strips of this length on bias and I absolutely hated every second of it um, again because it's just so flimsy. The width you choose depends on your preference. For me it also depends on this thing. You can push your strip through the opening here and press the sides of it into a fold. Theoretically it's very easy and foolproof but this fool here chose silk and with silk for me it never turns out completely even. It kind of depends on my luck that day. I think that this is a skill that might improve with practice but you know it's good enough and I can fold it in the center. I'm going to pin the lace here so it's out of the way. I start on the reverse and I secure the end of the tape here in the back where the marking for my strap is. To feel a bit more secure while sewing on the machine I'm going to baste it along the edge so the edge of my bias tape is on top of the edge of my dress and I'm going to sew in this fold here with a simple straight stitch. And now I can fold the tape over the edge. I will stitch it from the right side this time and I'll just keep stitching and folding it to create a strap. The stitch needs to be very close to the edge. Ideally the stitch would be at the exact same height as the one on the reverse. For me though, with silk, <laughs> it's almost impossible. Here once the strap portion started I tried not to pull on it too much while sewing so that the width stays continuous. It turned out okay-ish, um, the tension is a bit off sometimes. <laughs> Overall it looks fine to me, um, on the reverse however one shouldn't look too closely. <laughs> I tried it on and I pinned, and I pinned uh, the straps to the right length. As usual, I've overestimated how much I need. I'm going to secure them with a very narrow zigzag stitch along the seam of my bias tape and simply cut them back at an angle. Now I'm going to secure the lace over it. I stitched the lace following this sleeve here using a narrow zigzag stitch again and it sort of encircles both ends of my bias tape and hides them on the right side. This will also prevent the edges of the bias tape from fraying. So now I can cut them back and cut out the fabric. I also cut the edges of the lace because I'm only interested in the sleeves that are hiding the straps. I really like how it turned out overall. The way this rose looks on the fabric and transitions into this cutout. 
I took out the basting stitches next because now it needs to rest and droop until it's ready to be hemmed. I'm going to measure the lace on my pattern. Here again it will depend on the rapport of your lace as to how you can connect it into a ring basically. If you are very meticulous you can adjust the width uh, of your hem on your pattern in advance to fit the rapport of your lace uh, precisely, <laughs> you know, before cutting it. I didn't do that but I got a bit lucky here. As with my last slip dress this particular lace overlaps perfectly at about the same width so it's going to be roughly two centimeters wider than my initial hem. Once again I hope I can get away with it without causing any major tension because the hemline is somewhat stretchy. And I also do not intend to use all of these high points of the lace that would pull on the fabric. I probably should have started with it but initially wider laces like this one have several levels, right? There is the scalloped edge the middle part or several middle parts and the high points. I'm going to keep one high point here to mirror the neckline and create a fake slit with a cutout but overall I intend to only keep the edge and maybe a few middle parts. So first I'm going to connect the lace into a ring by overlapping it following the motif of the lace. Once again I got lucky, if the rapport of your lace doesn't align with the width of your hem at all, you can find interesting ways to overlap it, like we did on the neckline. Or if you choose to make a slit, you can just make the lace end there. I just cut it back and I think it turned out very neat. Now I'm going to mark this lace ring into four equal parts to align it to my center front and center back and the side seams. I double check that the high point is where I want it to be. I start by pinning my markings. While paying attention to the tension that's happening, I also pin all the lowest parts of the scalloping, so eventually where the edge of the fabric will be. For me it's these curved thingies. To get rid of all the needles I based all around the edge. Then I just make a sort of mental image of how I want for the lace to go, which middle parts I want to keep sort of. This rose for example I want to keep, you know, so that the trimming sort of flows organically. And then I start to base the parts of the lace that I want to keep onto the fabric. It requires time but not necessarily a lot of attention. I really enjoy doing stuff like that while watching my favorite documentary about spider monkeys. And it took me exactly 58 minutes to baste all of one <laughs> So I based it all around. These are the parts I want to keep. In the back it's going to be a bit more simple by comparison. I started by stitching the lowest parts first, so initially the line where I will cut my fabric. And then I also stitched above that where the motifs of the lace are going to act as embroidery. It obviously took a lot of time. It also took a lot of time to take out all of these basting stitches. Be careful here, take your time, don't pull on them uh, too harshly so that they won't leave any trace. And now I can finally cut it all back. First the fabric and now the lace. As you can see, I cut it back here um, quite dramatically to create this sort of full slit. There are so many beautiful ways to inlay, to insert lace. I hope this inspires you to try it out. This is what it looks like finished. I really like it. Kinda proud. Obviously it doesn't come close to the savoir faire of a Karine Gilson atelier, but I'm happy with the result. Still not fully convinced about the redness of it though, but if it should bother me too much, I'd be able to just dye it black, so there's that. Regarding care, since we spent so much time making these, I guess it goes without saying that I'd wash these slip dresses by hand. If there's no need to wash, I suggest you just simply steam it. I also advise to keep some of the leftover lace pieces if at some point there should be a hole or a stain that won't go out. One can take a little piece, like a little rose, and inlay it on top of it. But overall, with good care, this should last for a very long time. Bye!